One of my favorite feelings is when uh, I've just gotten onto that long haul plane ride across the Pacific Ocean where all of a sudden you know you're leaving your continent and you are about to arrive on a completely different part of the world. All of a sudden everything from home is starting to disintegrate a little bit and it's all the new possibilities are starting to be realized. Right now this is like the final place, the final temple that we're visiting of this whole trip. And so we've been, you know, it's been three days of filming and finally somebody has noticed the big camera and apparently we're supposed to get permission uh, to film here, which we don't have. And uh, we tried. We, f we wrote them and they never wrote us back, so I mean we tried to get permission. but. Yeah, so we got kicked off the top of the temple, so now we're at the bottom of the temple filming, and I can see over there the, uh, the security guard kind of looking down at us, but I think he just might be too lazy to come down here and get us, so we're good. I'm really happy that we got to come to Angkor Wat last because it's kind of like one of the most astounding things in the trip. It kind of ends off with a bang. It's, it's funny to me that Angkor Wat is not more famous in the West, a lot of people, they come out here and they, they, they have never heard of it before, but to me it's equally as amazing as the pyramids or the Great Wall. It's, uh, you know, the, the, these 1,100-year-old temples that are massive and architecturally just perfect. And there's so many of them, and they, it would have... It's one of those places where, you know, like Egypt, where they would have had, like, you know, the entire civil... You know, the entire city would have existed just to build these monuments to the king or to, to, their, to their gods. In, in this case, they were Hindu gods before and then, then they changed to Buddhism. So it's another interesting thing is that you'll, you'll be seeing all these temples dedicated to uh, you know, Vishnu and, and Shiva, but then next to it is a Buddhist temple and kind of an interesting way to, it's an interesting way to see the transformation and the history of this place. That's the ancient history of Cambodia, you can see in these temples. But another thing that's not quite as apparent is uh, the more recent history the, of the Khmer Rouge that happened in the past uh, 30 years. Basically, um, the country wasn't in the best shape. It was doing okay, but after uh, you know the Vietnam War, and uh, basically after, after the Vietnam War, uh, Cambodia was kind of confused as to where they stood on things and uh, a, a man named uh, Pol Pot, he, he had these radical ideas to, ha to turn Cambodia into this um, really radical communist state where everyone just existed to be like peasant farmers, you know, they would just, everyone farmed and the, the government ruled and the, the mil government and military ruled with an iron fist. Uh, so what they did was they, they, they just attacked 
uh, Phnom Penh, the capital. They overthrew the, the government and then they started off with their experiment, which was to get rid of the social elite. So basically doctors, lawyers, teachers, anyone who's educated. Uh, and I've heard things like people who wore, who wore glasses. Um, they were all taken and killed. Anybody who was not Cambodian, if you were especially bad, was Vietnamese. If you're Vietnamese, you were killed. Um, they just, they killed over two million people in, in about six years. Um, if you weren't killed, you were forced to go into these work camps um, and just forced to basically to be a slave. And, you know, basically you worked 16 hours a day and you were fed a, like a bowl of rice gruel. And, uh, and one of the weirdest things about it was that they were using children as the kind of the authoritarian figures because, you know, children didn't have, they, they were seen to be having like pure, they were pure slates. So you could take the kid who was three years old and raise him to be, you know, the most brainwashed person and, the, you know, give them the gun when they're seven and put them in charge of the field of workers. And if they saw someone doing something wrong, they would shoot them or kill them. and. And uh, that was the life of Cambodians for about four or five years. And then after, Pol Pot, after the Khmer Rouge was defeated, the country was still in shambles. Khmer Rouge was still around for another 10, 15 years. And, you know, it, it was a good 20 years of just chaos here. So it was only about, you know, the end of the 90s where Khmer Rouge was totally gone. Pol Pot died and it started to become safe to come here again. So, you know, it's 2009. I think probably it's it's been less than 10 years that, that tourists have really felt safe to even come here. Um, today we visited a, a landmine museum. Um, it was, it was uh, started by a man named Akira, who he himself has a really interesting story. He, um, he doesn't know his birthday, and he never met his parents. He says that they were, they were killed before he was five by the Khmer Rouge, and then he was taken away by the Khmer Rouge what, when he was like eight. So by the time he was ten years old, he was fighting for the Khmer Rouge and laying landmines for them. He claims to have laid thousands and thousands of landmines. And uh, then he says he escaped from the Khmer Rouge and went and fought for the Vietnamese. And then uh, later on for the Cambodian army that was against the Khmer Rouge. So he spent the last, you know, his teen years fighting against the Khmer Rouge. And then, uh, then when everything ended, he, he started the Landmine Museum and since then has dedicated his life to, uh, to um, removing landmines. And he can remove, like, he, sometimes he removes, like, 600 in, in a day, but he uh, says there's still, like, thousands, if not millions here. <laughs>